Good to see everyone. So thankful for being able to come together twice upon this day. Indeed, it is the Lord's Day. We have the six other remaining days to do for ourselves, and certainly it is not asked, the Lord is not asking too much for us to set aside this day that we can worship Him, come together to remember His Son, and truly we hope that all things we did this morning as well as this evening is in harmony with His will, that our worship will not be in vain, and that truly it will be acceptable unto Him. In our study this evening, in either talking to people about becoming a Christian or concerning those that have become Christians, there seems to be a good many that become disappointed with Jesus. Many, therefore, do not obey the gospel for, that reason, for these reasons. Many that have obeyed the gospel are no longer faithful. They no longer are our brothers and sisters are no longer worshiping with us because of one or more of the disappointments that they have had with Jesus. So I thought we would look at these things to help to encourage us to not be discouraged with those that we try to teach the gospel and yet are not successful at doing so, and to understand, not to sympathize, but to understand why it is that many do not continue to carry on their lives faithful before God. One thing that many people are disappointed with concerning Jesus is he disappoints any who look to him as a personal pawn. Another way of saying that is that they are disappointed when they look him or take him to be to their own personal advantage. And I think we can clearly see that in John chapter 12, where speaking about Judas, the disciple or the apostle that betrayed our Lord, the statement is made by him, why was this fragrant oil not sold for 300 denarii and given to the poor? This he said, not that he cared for the poor, but because he was a thief and had the money box, and he used to take what was put in it. Judas was a thief. We look at him as a betrayer, and certainly he was. But before he became a betrayer, he was a thief. And here we see that it could very well be that Judas may apparently took being a disciple of Jesus for his own personal advantage. Because we see the opportunity that he gave him, and we see the opportunities that he obviously took when the occasions arose. We too, in James chapter 4, find this statement. You ask and do not receive because you ask amiss that you may spend it on your pleasures. So the Holy Spirit here has made James aware, and of course us aware, of those who pray, but it's to fulfill their own personal reasons, fulfill their own personal desires. So clearly, we see even in the scriptures, the indication being that many do look upon Jesus as giving them some personal advantage, or as we said, a personal pawn. So to Christ, or rather to many, Christ and his church are the means of maybe business advancement. In Second Peter chapter 2 and verse 3, by covetousness they will exploit you with deceptive words. For a long time their judgment has not been idle and their destruction does not slumber. You know, I've heard of members of the church who sold cars, sold insurance, and better, Deb, this is not a pun on you, but they've sold insurance, they've sold Amway. I don't know if many of you remember uh, years ago, Amway was a big, uh, a big thing for a lot of folks. 
that there would be members who did these kind of things and they would drift from congregation to congregation after the, the potential prospects, the hopeful clients had ran out in one congregation, then they would go to another. So this truly fits what Peter talks about here. It's covetousness that they will exploit you. And sort of that is a disappointment that many people have when they realize that these type of things certainly are contrary. And as the statement is made for a long time, their judgment has not been idle, nor has their destruction slumbered. And to many, Christ and his church are the means of the social advancement or outright enjoyment, we might say. We have a lady that wise who left and went to a denominational church. And the denominational church that she went to was a church where the mayor of wise attended and a lot of the council members attended. So she wanted to sort of rub shoulders with the social elite. And therefore, she abandoned the faith and went and joined with them to advance her social life. And two, to many, Christ and his church, and again, no pun to Brother Reeves, the, the Lord's church is just good insurance in these fleshly, covetous endeavors that obviously can become a part of a person's life. Another reason why many become disappointed with Jesus is that he disappoints any who looks to him for earthly equality. You and I know we live in a time when equality is a buzzword. It's hardly ever that you can turn on the news or read a news-related article, but what it doesn't have something to do to express the idea of equality. But yet we find, for instance, in Luke chapter 12, verses 13 through 15, Jesus said, then one from the crowd said to him, Teacher, tell my brother to divide the inheritance with me. But he said to him, Man who made me a judge or an arbitrator over you. And he said to them, Take heed and beware of covetousness, for one's life does not consist in the abundance of the things that he possesses. But yet many people look to him for equality, to be, to make everything that happens to them in life fair. But you know, Jesus does not promise, does not promise that we will be treated fairly in this world. In 1 Corinthians chapter 6, let's read verses 7 and 8. Now, therefore, it is already another failure for you that you should go to law against one another. Why do you not rather accept wrong? Why do you not rather let yourselves be cheated? No, you yourselves do wrong and cheat and do these things to your brethren. So we must as Christians expect that no, things are not always going to happen to the point where that they will be considered fair to either or both parties that might be involved. But that's one thing that Jesus has not promised in this life. The fact of the matter is we are warned about bad treatment. In Matthew chapter 5, look at what he says in verses 11 and 12. Blessed are you when they revile and persecute you and say all kinds of evil against you falsely for my sake. Rejoice and be exceeding glad, for great is your reward in heaven, for so they persecuted the prophets who were before you. 
One other verse that we can look at is First Peter chapter 2 and verse 20. But what credit is it if when you are beaten for your faults, you take it patiently? But when you do good and suffer, if you take it patiently, this is commendable before God. This is talking about the relationship uh, where other people are not necessarily fair in their treatment toward us, even to the point of being abusive. Maybe even, as it mentions here, physically abusive. But still, it's what life is, and that we must come to expect and not be disappointed with the fact that we become a Christian because we're expecting Jesus somehow to make to level out everything to be equal in our lives and in our relationships with one another and especially with people of the world. That's just not it. So let us not become disappointed as obviously some people do. And let us understand that Jesus teaches us to look deeper, to look beyond the present inequities that are occurring. Let's read Philippians 1, beginning with verse 12. For I want you to know, brethren, that the things which have happened to me have actually turned out for the furtherance of the gospel, so that it has become evident to the whole palace guard and to all of the rest that my chains are in Christ. And most of the brethren in the Lord, having become confident by my bonds, are much more bold to speak the word without fear. Some indeed preach Christ even with, from envy and strife, and some also from goodwill. The former preach Christ from selfish ambitions, not sincerely, supposing to add afflictions to my chains, but the latter out of love, knowing that I am appointed for the defense of the gospel. What then? Only that in every way, whether in pretense or in truth, Christ is preached. And, th and in this, I rejoice. Yes, and will rejoice. For I know that this will turn out for my deliverance through your prayer and the supply of the Spirit of Jesus Christ, according to my earnest expectation and hope that in nothing I shall be ashamed. But with boldness as always, so now also Christ will be magnified in my body. What about life? What about death? See, was, did life treat Paul fairly? In the things that we read about Paul as we read through the many epistles that he wrote, did everything work out to his advantage? Equal? No. Paul suffered much. But yet, we see that he looked deeper. We see that he looked beyond all of the things that were happening to him and realizing these were to be expected, but did he ever one time even hint of his disappointment in becoming a Christian? No, he did not. And neither should we. So many people become disappointed with Jesus because he appoints anyone who looks to him for unrestricted fellowship. You know, society and the religious world that we're in has become all-inclusive. Society just, you know, and religions have two as well. In Matthew 7, you remember Jesus said in verse 13, Enter but the narrow gate, for wide is the gate, and broad is the way that leads to destruction. And there are many who go in by it, because narrow is the gate, and difficult is the way which leads to life, and there are few who find it. Just the last day or two, I saw where a Methodist church in Texas 
they put on what they called a family-friendly drag night. And when I'm talking about drag, I'm talking about homosexuals, transgenders, you know, a Methodist church. And the pictures that were shown were parents with children that they were having to hold in their laps. They were so small and others right on up through the teenage years. And there they were at this church being entertained, after all, it's family night, by these perverse, corrupt people, masquerading and playing as if this is normal, this is what you need to consider as a option in your lives. So truly, when Jesus says, there's only one of two ways to travel, and you only get on those one or two ways through one of two gates. And the gate and the way that we need to travel is that gate is narrow. And that way is difficult. But we know what the tendency is of most human beings. In fact, we find ourselves very easy to be tended to travel the path of least resistance. But we cannot, we must not do that in things of which pertains to what God's Word says, in things that pertain to my and your eternal salvation. The most important, the most valuable thing that you and I possess, and that is our soul. We cannot allow this attitude of inclusiveness to enter into our minds, but we must keep our focus narrow and we must keep it in the way that will lead to life. See, the Lord's way, the Lord's way is not broad enough to embrace everything. In fact, in 2 John 9, whosoever transgresses and does not abide in the doctrine of Christ, does not have God. Can language be any plainer? Whoever, that means everybody, anybody, that does not abide in the doctrine, the teaching of Christ, he has not God. I don't know of any simpler language that could be written, any other words that could be expressed to make it any clearer, any more understandable. And then he says, he who abides in the doctrine of Christ has both, the Father and the Son. So we see that we're not talking about open armness in the sense of acceptance and condoning of everything coming and going. Not only that, but we have 1 Timothy chapter 1 and verse 3. Paul says, I, I urge you when I was went into Macedonia, remain in Ephesus, that you may charge some that they teach no other doctrine. There is a wide range, a broad variety of things that are to be heard, that can be believed and accepted. And we must understand that it's not an acceptance, it's not an inclusion of all of these things that's going to make us right before God. To make us stand before God in the judgment day and be judged righteous. Notice too in Romans 16, verses 17 and 18. Now I urge you, brethren, note those that cause divisions and offenses contrary to the doctrine which you've learned and avoid them. For those who are such do not serve our Lord Jesus Christ, but their own belly. And by smooth words and flattering speeches deceive the hearts of the simple. If you'll notice 
a lot of what we see on news media and the things of that nature, they use what Paul talks about here, smooth words. Words that make us think, well, you know, if, 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 I'm, if I'm against this, then, then I'm, I'm not that kind of a good person that they're saying and what they're saying. But those are just smooth words. They're just words that flatter. And the purpose of all of that is stated, deceive, fool. And it will make a fool out of us to believe these things, to accept these things. Whether in the world around us or whether there's so much uh, false doctrines even among those professing to be Christians. Either way, whether it's society or whether it's in the church, all of this is still very true. It's very descriptive of the way they operate. And it puts us, needs to put us on guard to be aware of those smooth, flattering words that sometimes, as I say, it's just like, you know, butter that melts in your mouth. It makes you feel good. It makes you feel that this is, you know, what could possibly be wrong with this? But there's everything to be wrong with this when the fact of the matter is it's something contrary to the doctrine which we have learned. And if it is, it needs to be avoided. Another thing, the Lord's way, as we said, it's not broad enough to embrace all doctrines. But let us understand the Lord's way is broad enough to embrace all in every nation that obeys. So yes, God's way is a broad way in that sense. I mean, in fact, Peter made this statement when he went to the household of Cornelius. And we, we know the condition that existed between the Jew and the Gentile. Let's read it again. We're familiar with it, but in Acts 10, verse 34. Then Peter opened his mouth and said, In truth, I perceive that God shows no partiality, but in every nation, whoever fears him and works righteousness is accepted by him. So that which we must do in order that God is broad enough to accept is whatever nation we're in, whether we're red, yellow, black, or white, whatever nation, culture that we're in, if we fear him and we work righteousness, we know what righteousness is, all of God's commandments are righteous, so if we fear him and work righteousness, we are accepted by him. So, in one manner of speaking, the Lord's way is not broad enough to embrace each and every doctrine that's out there, but the Lord's way is broad enough to accept anyone who is willing to fear him and work righteousness. But again, many people get disappointed because Jesus does not have that all-inclusive nature and that's why we see and hear of so many churches that are proclaiming, just come as you are. Meaning that Jesus is all-inclusive. No restrictions. Come as you are. But that's truly contrary. That is a contrary doctrine. And two, many people become disappointed with Christ who look to him for an earthly utopia. What I mean by utopia is a place of no pain, no sorrow, no sickness. Jesus, again, does not promise to solve all of his followers' earthly problems. Now, that's not the message you get when you listen to the televangelist. It's all health and wealth if you become a Christian. But that's not what Jesus promised. That's a false promise. 
In John 16, verse 33, these things I have spoken to you, Jesus says, that in me you may have peace. In the world you will have tribulation. But be of good cheer, I've overcome the world. Where do we live? We live in the world. And by virtue of the fact that we live in the world, what can we expect? Utopia? Everything going our way? No, we can expect tribulation. But we have every right to be encouraged. We have every right to be of good cheer. Because there's one that's went before us. He showed us the way. It's not a way that we're, the first footprints are ours. The footprints are already there. The Lord says, I have overcome the world. In Acts chapter 14, Paul and Barnabas are going back over the cities and the towns where they had established churches. And in verse 22, it says, strengthening the souls of the disciples, exhorting them to continue in the faith and saying, we must through many tribulations enter the kingdom of God. And isn't that what you read when you read of nearly every city that Paul went into and the gospel was preached? Did you not see and read the tribulation that came upon him and those that were in his company? In some of the places they went, the gospel, the seed was sown, but it never produced anything whatsoever. In some places, it was a mixture. It was sown, there were some that received it. But there seemed to be always trouble, tribulation that followed. So we see then, as, as the statement is made, we must through many tribulations enter the kingdom of God, the kingdom of heaven. So we must not become disappointed with Jesus because things are just not all roses for us in the lives that we're living as Christians. Don't expect either a temptation-free life. Again, that's one of those things that Jesus has not promised. But here is what he has promised. 1 Corinthians 10 and verse 13. No temptation has overtaken you except such as is common to man. But God is faithful, who will not allow you to be tempted beyond what you are able but with the temptation will also make the way of escape that you may be able to bear. Look at the promises, and I'm using promises in the pool. Look at the number of promises that are just in that one verse. No temptation has overtaken you that such as is common. In other words, you're not going to be going through or face the temptation that no one else on this earth in any period of time has ever experienced. No, we all think of ourselves as unique, and there's a truth in that matter, but when it comes to temptation, no, we're not unique. No temptation will come upon us, let us rest assured, that has not been faced by someone else. So that's a promise. And it ought to be a comforting promise. You know, if we knew that we was the only one that has ever faced this, you could see the dire straits that we might be in as to whether or not we can overcome this one. Nobody else has ever faced it. But no, we, we, don't, we, we don't have that. We have the promise that it's common. It's something that others have experienced. Look at the other promise. God is faithful who will not allow you to be tempted beyond what you're able. God knows us. Sometimes better than we know ourselves. God knows our strengths. God knows our weaknesses. Sometimes we have more strength than we want to attribute ourselves to have. Sometimes we're stronger than we really are. So sometimes we are a poor estimate, but what the fact of the matter is, God knows. And God is in this matter of our patient temptation. He will not allow us to be tempted beyond what we're able. He knows us. 
who don't show strength in our weakness. Then look at the other promise. But we are with the temptation. Make a way of escape. There's no temptation but which but what there is not. A way to escape, to get out of it. Promises. God is faithful. And we need to rest assured in those promises. But not expect a temptation for your life. And not become disappointed with Jesus when we are faced with temptation. Maybe temptation after temptation after temptation. You know, the old saying, when it rains, it pours. Sometimes those are the episodes in our lives. But again, let us not become disappointed with Jesus. And what's true of an individual, let's understand, is true of the church. There is no trouble-free church in this world. The church of Corinth certainly wasn't trouble free. Look at the seven churches of Asia. The biggest majority of those had their problems. We read of other churches, churches of Galatia, we're studying that in a Bible study this morning, we see the problems they had. So let us not expect a problem free church in this world. In 1 Corinthians 11 and verse 19, for there must also be factions among you, that those who are approved may be recognized among you. Certainly factions are terrible, and they're bad when they happen. But there's also a good side when those things occur. It helps us to see and to understand and realize the truth, where the truth is. And not only that, we need to expect persecution for the fact that we are a Christian. Persecution for his sake. In Matthew 5, verse 10, we read this a moment ago, but let's look at it again. Blessed are those that are persecuted for righteousness' sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are you when they revile and persecute you and say all kinds of evil against you falsely for my sake. Rejoice and be exceeding glad, for great is your reward in heaven, for so they persecuted the prophets that were before you. You know, we talked about no one has ever faced temptations. We need to understand that, yes, someone else has. Well, when the matter comes to persecution and tribulation, don't think we're the only ones that have ever lived in the world that ever was faced with tribulation because there were many, and the Bible is full, both Old Testament and New, concerning the tribulations, the persecutions that followers of our Lord have experienced, and we don't need to expect to be any different. We don't need to be disappointed with Christ when persecution comes our way. And one other one in 2 Timothy, in chapter 3 and verse 12, yea, and all who desire to live godly in Christ Jesus may suffer persecution. All that live godly might suffer persecution. Is that what the verse says? No, the verse says all that will live godly in Christ Jesus will suffer persecution. Jesus does promise his support, his strength to us during these troubles. And we have everything that we can hold in the palm of our hand at our disposal to help encourage us, to help forewarn us, to help us to see, to be aware of the things that we need and should overcome. So in the close of our study. Jesus will disappoint you if you try to come to him on your own terms. If you try to say, well, I'll become a Christian if. Well, we don't bargain with God. Or I will, as a Christian, return to faithfulness 
if. Again, we don't bargain with God. It's not our conditions that God will meet. It's his conditions that we must meet. Jesus will not disappoint you if you unconditionally surrender to him. In Luke chapter 11, verse 28, but he said more than that, blessed are those who hear the word of God and keep it. That's the secret. <laughs> if there is a secret, this is it. If there is ever a recipe, this is it. To hear the word of God and keep it. What they're saying is, hear what God's word says and be absolute sure to make application of it. Otherwise, we don't keep it if we fail to make the application of it. In John 13, verse 17, Jesus said, If you know these things, blessed are you if you do them. There's no reason for us not to know. Like I've said, we have in the palm of our hand everything we need to know. Peter made the statement that the, all things that pertain to life and godliness, where is it? It's in the knowledge of our Lord, and we have the revealing of his knowledge. We have the revealing of his mind. So there's no excuse for not knowing things, and even less of an excuse for not doing them. And then, too, in Luke chapter 22, verse 42, said, Father, if it is your will, take this cup away from me. Nevertheless, not my will, but yours be done. See, Jesus is our example. We need to follow his steps. And if Jesus submitted his will to the Father, what does that tell you about your and my will? We need to submit it too. We have the perfect example to do it, to follow. And two, Jesus will not disappoint those who trust in what he's promised. What I mean is, if you obey the gospel, you'll be forgiven, just like he's promised. Mark chapter 16, verse 16, he that believeth and is baptized shall be saved. That's the Lord speaking and when the Lord says, if you will believe and be baptized, you will be saved, you can, you can guarantee that will be the case. If you will do your part, then the result that the Lord has promised will be yours. If you are faithful, you'll receive a crown of life because that's what he's promised. Revelation 2 and verse 10, Be faithful unto death, and I will give you the crown of life. You know, it's so easy to overlook verses like this and not think of them in terms of their being promises, because that's exactly what they are. They're promises. Be faithful unto death. The promise is, if you do this, then I will do this. We have God's promise. God doesn't break his promises. God doesn't lie. It's impossible for God to lie. Take it from Genesis to Revelation. There is no promise God has ever made. There is no unconditional promise that God has ever made that he has not kept. Never. Can you point me out a single individual in your life that you could say that of? Not many. Really and truly, not me. But there's no doubt about the promises that Jesus makes. If we seek first the kingdom of God, we will receive the things that we need. Again, he's promised it. Matthew 6, verse 33, But seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. Okay, what's the promise? The promise is, all these things shall be added to you. 
How many times have we ever looked at Matthew 6.33 and looked upon that as a promise? But that's exactly what it is. If we'll seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, that's our part. If we will do that, God has promised all these things, food, clothing, shelter, the things that we need to, of necessity to get us through life, God will provide. They will be added to you. And if we walk in the light, we will be cleansed of sin. And that too is a promise. In 1 John 1 verse 7, but if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another, and the blood of Jesus Christ, his son, cleanses us from all sin. But if we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. If we confess our sin, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sin and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. See, that is one of those if-then passages. If we confess our sins, then he is faithful and just to forgive, to cleanse us. Again, what we've read is a promise. Although as many times as we've read it, many times as we've heard it quoted, have we ever really looked upon it as being a promise? There are so many promises in God's Word. And we know God's reputation when it comes to promises. Let us not, let us never be disappointed with Jesus for any of these reasons that we've looked at in our study. Why become disappointed? Many do. And many will continue to become disappointed. But let not anyone in this building that's hearing my voice and the things that we've studied from God's Word tonight, may we never, ever be disappointed in our Lord. And tonight, if you need to render obedience to the gospel, remember the promise. If you believe and be baptized, you'll be saved. If you're here and you've obeyed the gospel, but yet you're unfaithful, remember, you've got to be faithful unto death to receive the promise of the crown of life. But if we will confess our sins, the promise is he will forgive. So if we can assist you to do these things, let it be known. While together we stand to sing.